Well, it, it feels very special to be invited to do this talk and to, to meet with all of you. And um, I've seen some people I know amongst you and many who I don't know, and certainly plenty of names that I, I recognize. So it does feel like coming into a community that um, is very um, significant and that in many ways we're, we're united in concerns for something that, that goes very deep and is vitally important in this time. So I'm going to talk. Um, I, what I want to do today, I mean, I thought about this talk and I thought, how can I address this? Because I actually end up spending a lot of my time talking to people who are therapists and encouraging them to think a bit more about the global implications of um, people's situation in the environment. And so I'm often more of a, a campaigner in my talking than a um, speaker in terms of using therapy to, to heal oneself. But the two are, are two sides of a coin. And certainly I think that ecotherapy and an involvement in the environment is something that is deeply important to people in terms of our, our practice and so on. So I'm going to make a start. And what I've done together, uh, what I've done is to bring together a number of things in this presentation, um, some of which are Buddhist thought, Buddhist texts, and so on, so Buddhist based material, some of which is from my own experience, my own direct experience of being in nature, and some of which is um, more Western based approaches to working outdoors, which maybe will give you some practical ideas and pointers um, if you're wanting to explore your relationship with nature. So I'm going to start, I'm going to screen share, so you don't need to watch me all the time. And my presentation will start largely with some images. So I'm just going to, oops, when it starts. Why is that not starting? There we are. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's not. And so we're faced with this situation. Buddhism offers us an understanding of it. And along with many other people, we, we feel an urge to speak out. Speaking out in such a situation isn't easy. It goes against the tide of society. But for many of us, it becomes a part of our Buddhist practice. Buddhist practice takes many forms. But if we look, if we look back to the days of the Buddha, then we see that actually Buddhist practice is very much rooted in the relationship with the environment. The Buddha himself went out from the palace, out from the village, out into the forests, out onto the paths, out into a place where he was surrounded by the ecosystem in a very live and special way. 
And if we read the Buddhist texts, then we find that actually they are full of references to the ecosystem. So it's very much something that is embodied in our practice and hence we, we go back to it time and again and hence our desire to protect it and our sense of its importance. I'd like to share this poem, which is a poem written by Saigyo, who was a 12th century Japanese Buddhist practitioner, a monk. Um, he was in a tradition of wandering monks who went out into the wilds of the country, who lived in nature, who wrote poetry which expressed their, their relationship with nature. And during this talk, I'm going to share a number of poems from Saigyo because I think they give us insight into our relationship with nature. Even in a person most time indifferent to things around him, they awaken feelings, the first winds of autumn. Even in a person most time indifferent to things around him, they awaken feelings, the first winds of autumn. And we can take these poems on many levels. You know, we can see in this both the literal autumn and the, the autumn of our lives, the changing seasons and so on and so forth. So there are, there are many different levels in a, a poem such as this. But more than anything, we can see the way that nature touches us, nature changes us, nature affects us, nature potentially awakens us. In Buddhist practice, we work with the seasons, with the times, with the cycles of nature, the daily pattern of things turning, changing. Symbolically, that same daily pattern in the mandala, the, the map of the mind, the processes that unfold as we go through the cycle of different stages, the turning of the year, the seasons of growth, the seasons of decay, the seasons of sleep and hibernation. And this cyclical process that we see in so many structures in Buddhism is something that I think we can take into our practice when we are working in the field, when we are involved actively. We can think in terms of a going forth and a coming back. And for the early Buddhists, there was in particular the rains retreat, the time when people went back and practiced deeply into their meditation in their huts, in their places of rest, away from the community, away from the world, when traveling became difficult. And I think we, we can think of times in our own lives when we can have something akin to the rains retreat. I wanted to share a, a short piece from the, the book that Casper referred to, The Acorns Among the Grass, and this is part of the retreat that, that he took part in. This is a little description of my, my experience sitting there. It is raining when we go into the bamboo grove to meditate. Light rain has been falling on and off all morning and Massimo warns us to be prepared for the rain. Walking into the grove, I feel a mix of interest and resistance. Soon drops of water are landing on my head and arms and I see the cloth of my trousers scattered with growing number of round patches as the water creates spots on the dry fabric. The sensation of water dripping on my body is not actually unpleasant when I do stop resisting it and relax. Drops continue falling on my knees, my shoulders and my head. They touch lightly like fingers tapping me, I sit, letting them arrive and noticing the patterns they make. The drops on my legs meet up and the water dip drips through the material of my trousers onto the ground. I'm getting soaked. I notice my tendency to tense against the wet and then remember to find my curiosity and relax. I sit enjoying the musical rhythm of the falling drops. I think what this piece shows 
is the way that when we start to practice in nature, it's like our attention starts to narrow down. We naturally become mindful. We naturally become aware of the, the detail of things. And this is important in terms of replenishing ourselves, of noticing that even in the midst of all the things that are going wrong in our lives, there are still things that are beautiful, that are touching. Even in the midst of the rain, there is still that musical rhythm of drops falling that actually can be quite pleasant. It gives us different stories, different ways of seeing things. And I wanted to flag up at this point, the one of the practices that's become quite popular in this country at the moment, forest bathing. And, you know, I think this practice, it's Japanese in origin and no doubt it, it owes something to that Japanese characteristic that, that Saigyu represents. The sense that going into the trees, going into the forest is something that is good for your mental health, just in itself. And people who practice this, they, they use a number of methods and so on, but basically it's about just going out, exposing yourself to nature. When we, when we do these things, I think what is interesting is that they naturally take us into a state of mindfulness. And I'd like now to bring you this opening section from the Satipatthana, the, the Sutta on mindfulness. You know, this very core text which talks about the foundations of mindfulness and the way that we can develop that practice, the very first beginning of it. There is the case where a monk, having gone into the wilderness to the shade of a tree or to an empty building, sits down, folding his legs crosswise, holding his body erect and setting mindfulness to his before. Always mindful, he breathes in. Mindful, he breathes out. And I think what we see in this is that, that image of the monk in the forest. You know, this is the common pattern. And even when it refers to a building, we're probably talking about a building that's temporary, that's in the forest, something that's, that's not cutting him off from the natural environment. And what we're seeing is a, a going into the environment, but also a, a bringing the body into the environment. This embodiedness is also something that comes alive from us for us when we go into nature. And so the foundation of mindfulness, the first thing we do is to come into the body and the body in space, the body in relationship, particularly in relationship to the tree. There's a lot of texts in Buddhism in which we can identify relationships with trees. And here, a description of my own grounding. Standing on the earth with my bare feet, I re reconnect. I feel the solidity of the ground beneath me. I breathe deeply. And as I do so, connect to the living, the life giving air of the planet. I trust in this moment that all I need is here. Everything is just as it is. So this is a very basic practice that we do. It's something we do at the beginning of every ecotherapy session, something that we do at the start of every online teaching to ground, to feel that connection to the earth, the primary mindfulness practice that, that starts us on that, that path to connection. The other day I was, I was reading about a, a new idea that's being promoted. Um, it's something that's been developed in uh, San Francisco. And I, I, think it's, um, I think it's very interesting because it, for me, it resonates very much with the Buddhist based practice that we teach. So I'm sharing it here. And this is the idea of awe walks. Um, these walks are basically the idea is that you go out into nature and you take a walk, you know, just a 15 minute walk once a week, they, they researched. And what they discovered was that if people just do a walk, well, it's beneficial. But if they do a walk and they're instructed to, on the walk, find something that is in some way awe-inspiring, it might be something very simple, something that 
is unusual, something that they're interested in. It might be looking at a leaf and seeing the sunlight through the leaf. It might be studying a piece of fungus that's growing out of a tree trunk. It might be feeling the texture of the, the dead leaves on the ground. You know, whatever it is, finding something and really engaging with something and evoking that sense of curiosity and wonder and the kind of experience that you have when you're a small child and you go out into nature and something wonderful appears to you. And so, you know, I think this, this experience of finding things which are special, that touch us, this is something that we can do and something which, which changes us. You know, in Buddhism, we know the mind is conditioned by the things we give attention to. And so giving our attention to something which is awe-inspiring, this can be something which is, is very powerful for us. And here I have a, a little description of my own experience. Walking in the woods and the meadows, I come to know the trees and the plants and the wildlife. Squirrels scurry across the ground in the oak woods. A jay is commonly in the same place among the cherry trees. Here in the poplars, it's lighter and where the leaves once danced, the bare branches now open up to the sunlight. Once I saw a woodpecker here, but he isn't around now. So the little details, the different birds, the animals, the leaves and so on, these are all things that touch me, that, that catch my attention, that shift something. And they inspire me to look, to wonder and to be curious. Look at this wonderful image of the, the spider's web between the trees. How often do we brush away spider's webs and not even look at them? And one of the things that they discovered with the ore walks was that they invited people to take um, selfies. They asked them to take three selfies and at the beginning, middle and end of the walk. And what they discovered was that as these selfies progressed, the one at the beginning of the walk, the person was um, big. The, by the end of the walk, the person had become a small image within the whole um, picture. In other words, the person had put themselves into a bigger landscape by the end, quite naturally. You know, they weren't told to do this, but this is how they represented themselves. And I think one of the things when we go into nature is that we start to see ourselves basically as part of something bigger. We see the big system and we, we stand in awe of it, but also we see its interconnection and its interconnection with us. And this is. This is rather like the, the concept of Indra's net, which is um, a very common Mahayana concept, the idea of an infinite net that stretches across the universe with mirrors or jewels at each intersection of the net that reinforce each other, reflect each other. And so, you know, we are part of the ecosystem. Each part, each junction in the ecosystem is a part of the whole and a representation of the whole. And we start to feel ourselves to be in this way. We feel the, the interconnection of things. And here's the term interbeing that, that Thich Nhat Hanh coined, the idea that everything is interconnected in some way. Everything comes into being in dependence on conditions. Of course, when we, when we walk out, it's not always pleasant. Here's a, a very muddy patch in our local um, uh, country park, which we always have to pass as we're going, and it's always a matter of picking one's way. The mud is almost unpassable. We pick our way across the quagmire, trying to follow the steps of others, but sliding about nevertheless. And you can see some good skid marks there in the, in the mud. Going into the dark spaces is, is something that is very central to Buddhist practice. You know, we can think about going into nature as being something pleasant and easygoing and something that will fill us with joy and inspiration and so on. But the Buddha himself practiced in nature in places that were unpleasant, places that were disturbing. And this particular text, the Sutta on Fear and Dread, it's one of my favorite texts, actually. Um, it's very much about how the Buddha 
himself at the start of his life, prior to his enlightenment, practiced by going out into the forest and sitting in places that were scary, the, the forest shrines where the, the spirits were supposed to be, and how he sat there until he discovered a calm mind and so on. So this, this practice of going out into the forest was something that he used in order to cultivate his mind state and to overcome his experience of fear and dread. The brambles have overgrown the path in places. They snag my coat as I walk. No one has been this place for a while. I press on. Small birds in the willows, the side of me, keep up a lively chorus. Well, this is the, the path through the brambles. This is just in our local uh, woods. And sometimes the path becomes difficult. Another Saigyo poem. Take a good look. Even the blossoms of the old cherry seem sad. How many more times will they see the spring? And again, we have this, this poignancy in Saigyo's poem, rather as in the first one, that, that sense of time passing, impermanence, aging, change, seeing it in the, the blossoms of the cherry, having a sense that this will not go on forever. This moment is transient. This moment too will pass. So both in the scary places and in the beautiful spaces, we, we experience these changes. We experience that life is this combination of light and dark, pleasant and unpleasant, easy and difficult, becoming and disappearing being born and dying, all of these processes which are the cycle of life and nature, they're all there in every moment. And it's our relationship to them that causes us difficulties, but also which can bring us alive. And the Buddha, when he practiced, he went into the forest. This is the Sutra on Fear and Dread again. He, he experienced that, first of all, it was frightening. I love this, this bit. While I was staying there, a wild animal would come or a peacock would make a twig fall or a wind would rustle the fallen leaves and the thought would occur to me, is this the fear and terror coming? And then the thought occurred to me, why do I just keep waiting for the fear? And... You know, I think this is so, so much the kind of experience that I've, I've had myself, you know, sitting in the dark in the woods and you hear a noise and it's so amplified. And what he says he did was he just sat with the fear. When the fear came, if he was sitting, he stayed sitting. If he walked, he walked and so on. And he basically sat it out. He toughed it out against the fear and the fear and dread they dissipated. And what's interesting, if you go on and read the rest of this text, is that this text actually then goes on to describe the night of his enlightenment. In other words, his enlightenment came out of this experience of going into the forest, facing his fears in the forest, and overcoming that fear, subduing that fear. And I, I think this, this message that enlightenment is something about this relationship to this fear of the, the existential impermanence that we see around us when we go into nature. This is very powerful. This is something that we can, we can sit with. So yes, going into nature is replenishing. It's something that we can do in order to find relaxation, but it's also something which will give us wisdom. I look at the water blocking my path. Dead leaves have fallen into the old watercourse and are decaying. The water is dark with iron and stagnant, its surface tainted with an oily sheen. Yet the blue sky and the soaring willow trees are reflected in its surface. 
light and dark, joy and sadness, coming and going. It's all there, moment by moment. And this image, this is images of life coming back. Some of you will recognize this is actually the image of a, a burnt tree after the fires in Australia last year and the life springing back from its base. The tree dies, there is destruction. And yet, when we look at the detail, we see the strength of life reappearing. And here we are back on the path with the brambles, coming towards the end of the path, suddenly the burst of sunlight. And I'm reminded of this verse from Shoshinge, uh, the, the text written by Shinran, Pure Land Buddhist teacher in Japan. The light of compassion that grasps us, illumines and protects us always. The darkness of our ignorance is already broken through. Still the clouds and mist of greed and desire, anger and hatred cover as always the sky of true and real Shinjin. In other words, nature provides metaphors, metaphors in particular for our nature, our own nature as humans. We are clouded by our ignorance, our greed, our anger, our hatred, all these emotions that constantly arise in us, all these attachments and clingings and fears. And yet, beyond the clouds of these, there is the sun of enlightenment, the sun of Buddhaness. And just sometimes it breaks through. And I think this is the, the metaphor that nature so often gives us, the hope. And so I'd like to finish with another poem from Saigyo. Not stopping to mark the trail, let me push even deeper into the mountain. Perhaps there's a place where bad news can never reach me. Not stopping to mark the trail, let me push even deeper into the mountain. Perhaps there's a place where bad news can never reach me. I think this, this poem is, is very telling because when we read it initially, we read it as one of escape. You know, perhaps if I go far enough away from the world, then I can escape from all these troubles. And, you know, so often we, we meet people who read the newspapers and then push them away or don't even read them in the first place, who avoid the things that are going on in life. But actually, when we reread this, we realize that it actually is saying something beyond this. You know, what is this mountain that we push deeper into? it, And what is this place that we discover? Perhaps the mountain, perhaps it's our own mountain of karma, our own mountain of delusion. Perhaps it's the mountain of delusion in the world. And where is this place where bad news can never reach me? Perhaps it's not the place of no news, but perhaps it's the, the place where news has been transformed in some way, where somehow we hear things in a different way. And so, I'll leave you with this last thought from Saigyo. Thank you very much. <laughs>